Hello, my friends. I wanted to give you a heads up really quickly about our brand new Facebook group. You can find us on Facebook. Addiction Unlimited is the group name. We're going to have tips, tricks, discussion, videos, all kinds of things over there. It's just an easier place for me to engage directly with you. I'd love to see you over there. Addiction Unlimited. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co-founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Angela Pugh. We are recording in my lovely hometown of Kansas City today, and I'm really excited to bring another story to you guys about a mom's perspective dealing with heroin addiction. This is something we've been talking about a lot recently. Obviously, it's all over the headlines, but I think these stories are so important to share, especially for families, so they know they're not alone. They're not going through it alone. There are answers, and and there are some victories. You know, it's important that we share those victories, too, and, and remember that we do recover. No matter how bad things get or how long it may take, you have to always keep in mind that as addicted people, we do recover and we can recover, regardless of how bad it is. There's always hope. So let's take a minute and let's welcome Sandy to the show. Thank you, Sandy, for coming and doing this with me. Hello. Thanks for having me. So tell the listeners a little bit more about you and your story. Well, my story started off about five years ago where my son had been uh, in college. He played college football and at the last game of his uh, his senior year, broke his tibia and shattered some bones in his, in his foot which was pretty traumatic for him. And he had to stay up at school for three additional months for rehab. And from then on, it just kind of spiraled out of control from there. So I'm assuming, obviously, he got pain meds at that point. Yes. And if I remember correctly, he was quite a talented athlete and a decorated athlete. Yes. He played most of his life. He, if he had the chance, he would have tried to play further or uh, wanted, you know, he had dreams of even being in the military. You know, he was that type of person who wanted to be a SEAL or a Ranger sure. and all that stuff. So when this happened, everything just shattered. Yeah. His dreams. Yeah. His future. Now, I do want to point out, I it did spiral out of control at that time. But throughout his career, five years being there, it was very easy to, if you have a pulled hammy, if you had something wrong, you got whatever you needed. Right, right. So I think that feeling of after you took something, it it was a certain feeling. And if he is an addict, I think there's some people that take a drug and they don't like the feeling of it. Right. There's others who take the drug and right away they're like, "Mm mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah, we had an episode on a few weeks ago with one of uh, my friends too, David, and he was an opiate addict. And he said literally the first time he ever took a pill, like he knew that was it. Almost, it was almost like its own little love affair (laughs) that he had. And he knew from the moment he took it. And I was exactly the other way. I'm just a good old fashioned drunk. So, you know, the times that like I've had dental work or something where I've had to have pain meds, like I hate them. I do oh. not like how it makes me feel. I don't want any part of it. I don't like being high. There's some weird side effects that come with opiates and stuff that I don't like. So yeah, it's not my thing for sure. Yeah. So I wonder that too, because there are so many people, like you're saying, any injury, even any tiny thing that he would have had, He would have been able to get muscle relaxers and some level of pain meds probably. I wonder if he just didn't take them enough to have withdrawal symptoms or anything like that. Or maybe when you're taking it at somewhat of a normal level, the withdrawal symptoms aren't uncomfortable enough to notice. You know what I mean? Right. Because you hear that a lot. People have had them over the course of their life or whatever, but didn't get addicted until a certain point. Right. And I don't know if that was – and also it's prescribed. You know, right, I think in your mind, right. you're thinking... It justifies it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It justifies it. And until that, that injury and it really hit him and he kind of spiraled out of control because of that, I think that was just 
something he could rely on. I mean, right. that's just where he went. Right. He went into the hole, the deep hole, so as we say. So how, at what point did you know, as parents, at what point did you know that he had a problem? You know, when we look back now, we could have probably known it a couple different times throughout his career in college. But at, at the same point, you know that they're drug tested. You know that they're, there's precautions. They're supposed to be, you know, if, yeah. if different teammates that were kicked off the team because of use of right. things. So you kind of trust the system right. and hope it's... Uh, they were probably testing positive for like marijuana and things like that. They're not... I mean, well, and if you're prescribed from you're the, prescribed, right? The doctor, That's what I'm saying. The team doctor, so they're going to expect that to show up, which the team doctor ended up being in trouble. So, elaborate on that a little bit. How did the team doctor get in trouble? The team doctor was after my son had left. That team doctor was put into jail to prison for improperly prescribing. Yes. So, in my perspective, we never went back or said anything. We figured there's uh, there was a number of people who did. Right. There was a number of kids who walked out of that school addicted. I would be so, I don't even know the word, my level of anger. You know, like I have this feeling, a sense of responsibility. Like I have an enormous sense of responsibility to the people I work with and families that I work with. Like to just do the absolute best job I can do, you know, and to provide the best information and transparency and all that stuff. Because... You're in a position where you have to trust the professionals, right? Like it's not optional, but right. to trust those people with your children. You know, it, it's just so awful to me to hear those kind of stories. And it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It really is everywhere. Yeah, it's very easy. And, you know, even when there was times when it was semester and they were doing their finals, they were all on Adderall yeah. easily. And that's one of the, you know, that's a very... It's super uh, addicting. common, too. Yes, addicting. That's very addicting. Yeah, it's horrible. I think people don't realize how addictive Adderall is or, you know, that it it's just kind of a legal. It's amphetamines. Yes. You know I mean, that's what it is. Yes. I mean, and I didn't learn that until later on when I would speak with my doctor friends. And they're like, that's that's one of the highest addicting drugs there is, yeah. especially if you're not on the right dosage. Yeah. And you can tell when someone's not on the right dosage. It's worrisome to me, too, when they're giving it to kids so young. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm not a doctor. So I don't know chemically the dangers of doing that. I just think from a logical standpoint, you know, your brain isn't even done forming until somewhere around your mid-20s. Some of the most important parts of your brain, right? Which is why they always tell everybody don't smoke pot. That's why I tell young people don't smoke pot because your brain isn't finished yet, you know? Right. But at the same time, they turn around and prescribe Adderall and really like all these things. Adderall, I think, is probably the, the biggest name everybody knows. But they prescribe it like it's freaking gummy bears, right. you know? Like it's everywhere all the time. And I'm like, well, that can't be good for a 10-year-old, no. you know? And if it's in the home and the older kids know that it's there or whatever, you know. Right. And I mean, just from experience from my younger kids, it's a lot of kids come to school and they just get it right out of the, the medicine cabinet. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm not saying, like you said, I'm not a doctor either. And I'm sure there's a lot of younger kids who do need it yeah. to pay attention. But there's also that, that idea of that your your kid has to be as smart as the next kid. Right. And you got to right. keep them up. And it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Back in the day, you just, you weren't smartest kid in the class. Right. You know, it just, that's just how it was. Or you were the class clown, but we didn't, we didn't get right. medicated. Like when I was in school, we right. weren't medicated children. And you it know? just sets them up, I think, for they have to achieve, achieve, achieve. Yeah. And nowadays it's, I don't. It's scary. It's scary. It's yeah, too I much agree. Pressure. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's a lot of pressure. So, how was he emotionally? I know you touched on that a little bit in saying that a lot of his future plans and his dreams were kind of taken away with his injuries. Do you feel like he started to bounce back from that at all, or did he kind of stay stuck in that? He was stuck. He was stuck. He came home after three months, which we thought would be the best, you know, rehab up there in school, came home, wasn't really in a hurry to find a job, wanted a job, isolated himself. Right. Um, very much. I mean, it was concerning to me. My husband was more like, well, he's, you know, he's been playing college, let him, you know, he's relaxing. He, he'll, you know, he's going to find a job. And then I kind of got to the point where like, okay, you need to go find a job. Right. This, you know, 
And I think part of it was he was realizing he had a problem because he didn't have his prescriptions to be filled anymore by this point. Now you're looking for it elsewhere. And that's where I think it got a little bit out of control. At what point was it on your radar that it was out of control? Was it once he was back home? Yes. Oh, definitely back home. You know, we were very naive. There should have been times when we knew exactly what was going on. There was all kinds of signs. There was, he was just out of it, you know? He'd be sitting on the couch, nodding his head. Right. Like falling asleep. Well, what are you tired from? Well, he was getting up and he was working out at five o'clock in the morning and then he was working out again, you know? Yeah. Um, Okay, well, he's just tired. Do you really feel like you should have known what was going on? Because I think if you haven't had any exposure to that, how in God's name would you know that's what was going on? You know, like it's second nature to me, but that's because I'm surrounded by this all the no. time. But I think if, like you're living, you have your American dream family and you're doing your thing and living your life and all of a sudden your kid is nodding off on the couch. I don't think there's any way that you would naturally assume a drug problem. No. You know? No. Had no idea. And there, there was even a point where I walked down in the basement and he had one of those stretchy bands mm-hmm. around his arm mm-hmm. injecting. I was that naive. He said it was steroids. Well, I was I was still concerned. I was, you know, I, I didn't even know enough about steroids to right. know. You know, but I knew it was you know, for work, you know, sometimes they did it for working out. And that's what I said to my husband. At that point, he didn't even comprehend that he was shooting up heroin. Um, Well, I mean, he has been an avid workout person forever. Like that's an easy cover for him. You know what I mean? To say steroids. And again, like if you haven't had any exposure to those things in life, you know that I think it just makes perfect sense. Like, my head wouldn't go right to heroin, you know? No, but at that point, I wish if I would have known, I could have done something about it. Maybe I could have grabbed him at that point and taken him somewhere. Now, I don't know if he would have been ready to go or... But I think at that point, he was probably confused. He knew what was going on. He was starting to have a a real, real problem. Yeah. He was addicted. But could I have stopped something a little bit sooner? But now, five years later... I know that he had to go through this and we had to go through this. Right. There's not really any way to stop it. I know. I (laughs) know. I talk about this a lot too where I think you and I were just talking about this before we started recording. Like parents always think it's their fault. They really do. Parents take all this responsibility on themselves. And my mom did the same thing. You know, I remember my mom looking at me at one point after I was sober and she was crying and she said, I just wish I knew what I could have done. And I was like, there's or what I could have done differently. That's what she said. I wish I knew what I could have done differently. And I was like, diff- like, this has nothing to do with you. This is not on you. Like, I did this. You know, I did this. I had this thing. I was aware of it. And I kept nurturing it. I'm the one that made it bigger, you know. And not even that I had a ton of control of myself during that time. But it certainly was not my mom's fault. <laughs> no, but the number one question also in meetings and places that we've been is Why? Why did you do this? I mean, that's such a broad question, but it's as a parent, you're thinking, why, 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 what did I do wrong? Yeah, right. What problems did you have that maybe I didn't see? What was on your mind that you couldn't let out? You know, why? Especially the dads, I think. Yeah. Take responsibility for the, for the boys. Sure. And I think really it's just that at the core of everything, for most addicted people, is it, it's just feelings. We have an inability to deal with feelings, certainly when they're really big, you know, so most of us, like when you hear addicted people share their stories, there are usually events that happen where we sort of take another step deeper into our addiction. You know, it's like I can look back at mine when I started drinking, it was heartbreak right? The my first love, I was 19 years old, and we broke up and I broke I ended it and I and I was devastated. And it was just my stubbornness that didn't put the relationship back together. But I was devastated. And I had no ability to cope with any of those feelings. And literally, and I was a pretty well adjusted young person, I was a pretty well adjusted, confident person at that time in life. But all that stuff was just too big. And I didn't understand it. I couldn't sort it out. I certainly couldn't deal with it. And that's when I very first started drinking. 
And I could, I would have never even been able to say at that time that that I was trying to deal with my feelings. I didn't recognize that. Right. I just knew that I could drink and I had fun. I don't even know that I thought I was depressed at that time, but but it was horrible. And then I drank for many years, kind of on a plateau. And then I had another significant event. I drank a little bit more. You know, so yeah. you have these things. And I think it is an inability to deal with feelings. And what that causes is anxiety. So then I get super uncomfortable, right? Right. And then I don't feel good about myself because why can't I deal with my feelings? Why am I so uncomfortable? What's wrong with me that I'm so uncomfortable? Even around your family and the people that love you. you like, it's so hard even for us to figure out. But that's why, to me, when you share this story about him, it makes sense to me that he went through that injury, right? And his whole future changed in a split second. And and this is a young person that doesn't have the ability to sort through feelings and identify them and talk about them, you know? like but Where's the you, communication? You know, that to right, me, right. Now, nowadays kids don't know how to deal no. with things or anxiety because there's no communication, real, one-on-one, face-to-face yeah. communication. And that's what you need to work through things. But I think you have to be willing to do that. You know, like I couldn't, even if somebody would have offered that to me and you know I have like the best mom on the planet and I'm sure she probably did come to me and try to connect with me on some level and figure out what was going on with me I moved uh, across the country pretty young but I'm sure my mother was very there for me right but I don't know I think I think that you feel so bad about yourself because you can't deal with your own stuff like you don't want to tell your mom like, yeah. I didn't want my mom to know because I felt weak. I didn't want to tell my mom I was weak. You know? Oh, I know he didn't. Yeah. I mean, I know at this point because he really valued, I know, his dad's opinion. And mine. Sure, sure. Um, and then when you have that label on you of the child who had everything yeah. given to him and, and, and he uh, excelled in everything, uh, was smart, had, you know, the athletic ability, you could just see it in his face. Yeah, I mean, until I mean, and then on our part, there was the denial. That's the what's wrong? Oh, nothing's really wrong. You're, th- you know, he'll get over it. And then all of a sudden, something comes up that's missing, which is so common with all, yeah, with yeah. all those addictions. I mean, that's just a, the next natural step. Yep, yep. And then you're in denial. You're in denial then too, because <laughs> you're trying to think of you know who could have taken something or why you know where is it at? You know, all it's just kind of like a a weird dream that yeah. you're in and you don't want to admit it there's the embarrassment there you you uh, you realize how vain you are in so many areas of your life and really the most important thing is your child there's you know the neighbors the families you know all this 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 and after you go through it and when you experience something like this that really doesn't matter and that's hard I mean that's kind of a lesson learned because a lot of people, you just can't say that to somebody. You mm-hmm. couldn't have said it to us at the time until you go through it. Any type of life-altering situation, it's it changes you. For sure. Well, and you, I mean, addiction will humble you every opportunity you give it. You know, oh, yeah. it, and again, same thing as the addicted person. Like any moment that I wanted to think I had some control over my drinking or like I had some say in the matter, you know, like my drinking would take me down to the bare bones and humiliate me. You know, it's like it will just it will humble you every opportunity you give it. And it does put things in perspective, you know, the the things that we hold important or that we think are important which I think is one of the reasons to have always been so open about my addiction and my journey and just really being transparent about the things that I did and choices I made and arrests and blah, 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 all my drama. Because I think it is so important for people to know that, number one, you we can recover, right? Like right. we can get through this for sure. And number two, that 
it doesn't make me a lesser person because I have been through this stuff and because I was, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I was a pretty awful person for a long time. Right. You know, I did some really awful things, certainly things I would never in a million years do in my right state of mind. It just takes you over and it takes over your life. But I can talk about that now openly and be transparent about that stuff because I'm proud of who I am. And that's so important to spread that message you know, because people have to stop hiding from it. It's like right. you need to feel comfortable to get help sooner and, and to not isolate yourselves as families and parents because you're embarrassed what people might think. Like we've got to be more comfortable reaching out and asking for help. And sharing your story. I mean, from from my side of a parent, you know, having to see someone go through it. But anybody that fights cancer, fights uh, addiction, fight, I admire that person. Right. I mean, I can look at you – and I know, I don't know everything you did or what, you know, and bad things, but everybody does bad things. Yeah. But you fought through it and you made it. And that's unbelievable. That's the part I wish more addicted people would understand. Right. Because I don't you don't, about what you don't you did. expect people to admire you. Like, even, you know, so then there's the stigma of addiction, but there's this whole stigma of sobriety too. And people think you're weird. And like, I actually, a few months ago, was at dinner with a bunch of people and this lady like apologized for me that I I was an alcoholic. She was like, "Oh, I'm sorry," and I was like, "Sorry? What the hell are you sorry for?" Right, <laughs> like, right. Like, there's nothing to be sorry for, you know. And I think you expect that response, right? So you have your own sort of shame about the stigma of being a sober person and what that means to people. And I just have never felt that, you know. But we don't expect people to respect and admire us for getting through that stuff. And I wish more addicted people would understand that's the response you get more often than not. And when I was first sober and would tell people, no, I'm sober three months or four months, however long it had been, and people would have that response like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Right. Then I was like, oh, really? <laughs> cool. But do you also realize that when you do get that negative response, it's just people that don't have the knowledge Oh, for sure. You know, it's not that you can, you know, you kind of feel sorry for them, but you have to realize, okay, they don't know. They don't understand because. Well, and I think too, like most of us don't get sober without some tragedy, right? They're usually like we say rock bottom. Like most of us have some sort of insanity that gets us to sober. Right. And so I think too, when people feel that, oh, I'm sorry, it's kind of that, oh, wow, you must have really been through hell. Right. Right. And I do get that. I do get that. Because yes, we go through hell. And they don't know what to say. Yeah. Because I know if I bring something up to somebody, I have to be prepared that, you know, some of my closest girlfriends, they don't know what to say. And I don't expect them to know what to say. Right. And I don't want them to feel bad. Yeah. But it's also I let them know it's okay. You can ask me whatever you want. You you know, I'll I'll tell you horror stories. Right. If you want to hear it. But it's okay to have those feelings because I used to feel like that. I didn't know anything about it. I thought certain kind of people just got to that point. Of course. So that's what's humbling now because it's I anybody. think I feel really grateful too because I feel like my addiction has made me a stronger person than I ever even knew I was capable of being. And I have so much gratitude for that because and and other people go through it for other reasons, right? You know, right. like I have clients that I work with a couple of people I think of off the top of my head that went through divorces after like 25 and 30 years of marriage. That is an equally devastating thing, right? right, That will cause huge change, will cause somebody to make huge change in their lives. It's not just addiction that gets you there. But it's like you have to have something, like I always say, addiction was just my catalyst. That was my catalyst that made me pay attention and that made me take my life seriously and want to be better. And if I wouldn't have had that, I would have never had anything to push me and challenge me to see how far I could really go. Right. You know, and then I wouldn't get to be the person I get to be today. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes you have to look at the bad things that happened in your life are actually God's way of using you. Some people can go through life and never really get that experience, and right. good or bad. Right. But to kind of know that he's you're living life, so to speak. Yeah. I think this part of our journey is we've lived life more the last five years right? than we did all the way up to this point. I mean, yeah. it was just kind of repetitious. 
and you just did this and you know it was all the same thing and you thought life was life was wonderful you know I, I never... always frame it too as like I try not to get into the good or bad thing you know like I try not to label stuff like I feel like it's all just necessary like everything you can label it good or bad whatever but I feel like Every piece of it is just my stepping stone to the next stepping stone. It doesn't mean that everything is always going to feel good. Right. It doesn't mean things are going to be easy, right? But it's all necessary to get where I'm going. I have to go through all that stuff. How boring would life be, though, if it was always so easy? Well, I don't know if you should say that to an addicted person. I, okay, really? Okay. Because <laughs> I think most of us really want it to be easy. <laughs> I, yes, I'm, I, right. I have to remember took, that. My, it took me a long time to get to the times. place where I could appreciate some adversity. Like, I can appreciate it now. Yeah. But, you know, when I was not very healthy, healthy and lazy, painfully lazy and unmotivated. Um, I wanted it to be always easy. You know, but I yeah. think that's another one of our distortions as addicts too. Like we have this weird distortion that like we are heartbroken when things are challenging. You know, like right. we feel so victimized when something is difficult. And it's like, no, dude, that's just life. You know, it like is. it's just life. You just walk through it like everything else. Yeah. And my perspective is a little bit different because of my age. Because mm-hmm. I can look back 20 years from now when I was in my 30s and and think – Wow, that was so stupid what I worried about right. back then. So, I mean, it is just, it's it's living life and maturing yeah. and going, working through things. Right. So, I mean, it's easier for me to say, because I can talk to my kids and it just goes in one ear and out the other. But, right. You know, but it is, I just, I would just wish that everybody knew that when something, it's, it's, it's what you do with the situation. Yeah, for sure. And if you make it through. So, I mean, life in general is just challenging. Right. There are always challenges. There are always things to overcome and figure out. And it doesn't stop. You know, it's just you have to get better at handling it so it doesn't throw you so far off track. Right. You know, it doesn't happen any more to one person than another. It just happens at different times in different ways. But life is still going to happen. Right. So I don't know if this will help. He got a job, uh, was working his job. And what, what when we finally found out, it was little weird things because he would be sweating through his clothes at work can you bring me another something of clothes you know another pair of right. clothes because didn't even phase us right. you know what why is he you know because i you know it's working out and i'm yeah. well finally he called one day and said i need to come home i have i have a problem and that to me i thought i and he was just at work he was at work okay but every four hours you know he was using at work or he so was, what did he say when he came home he Kind of, he broke down and was crying and said he had a problem. I think it just hit him that he couldn't do it anymore. You know, it was it was true. Like he couldn't keep up the charade right. anymore? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like I said, you know, we were having to run close to work because he's sweating through it. And he's sweating because he's trying to withdraw himself. Oh, he's trying okay. to do okay. this himself. And I think it got to the point where he couldn't do it. He knew he couldn't do it himself. They say it is the most painful experience in the world yeah. coming off of opiates. Yeah. I mean, he had this, this this good job. He was number one. He was proud of himself, but he couldn't stop. So then we, we took him to a detox. We didn't know where to go. I mean, we had no idea. And that's the worst thing for parents because you don't know where to start looking. You don't yeah, know what right. you're supposed to do. You I don't, hear that all the time. never knew you're supposed to go to a detox first, you know, or, to, you know, try and dry out before you actually go to a rehab place to try and get the help, the mental right. help. And went there and, you know, at that point, oh, he's going to be okay. You know, he's going to detox. This was a five-day. No, he only stayed three. Got out and he was ready to go. He was ready to go and party and do it. And then that's when things just kind of That's when really the journey really began. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it really did. Yeah. And people would tell us. I mean, we, we went to a facility – uh, in Kansas City, mm-hmm. which was really for a little bit younger kids, but they would they had a couple older ones too, and uh, very successful with the kids. But you get a boy who's already been through high school, through college, a little a little bit of a narcissist. And oh, this aren't place, we all? <laughs> this place just wasn't wasn't right, you yeah. know, for him. He he was above this, and but the the love and the support and everything was wonderful. He just wasn't ready. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't ready. Uh, this is where you stay with a family and you go to the meetings. So he's not there 24-7. Right. 
uh, found a family, lived with them, wonderful. You know, we did meetings Fridays and Saturdays, Monday nights. It was it was the best thing ever that we could have found for ourselves. Right. Mm-hmm. This whole process, you know, thinking that Will was going and was doing this and, and, and working the program, really what helped was during these, these two years there was for us. We learned the stories of everybody else. We got advice. We've got, we went to the meetings. We did everything and heard stories. We became more knowledgeable and we understood that at this this time we had to start working on ourselves we couldn't help him but this we still hadn't gotten through the steps because we were still enabling Mm -hmm, we were still mm -hmm. following him we were still checking everything out he did we we were smothering him and all he wanted to do was go get high at what point in this journey did you find kansas city recovery in me well he had come and gone from this program a couple times and then he had gone off to their facility out of state right okay yeah i remember that and that didn't work so when he came back there was a couple different options that he could do but you know angela he would pretty much look us in the face and say i i don't want to get clean but we weren't listening we were going to help him we were going to we were going to fix this we were going to make things right we were you know it was it was kind of all about us at the same time, we knew what we needed to do. But in his instance, you know, we had people telling us, you need to call the cops. You need to do this. You need to do that. And we didn't do it because, one, we felt like he had succeeded so far in life already, he could get past this, and this couldn't. This wouldn't be on his record. This wouldn't be, you know, this wouldn't be a, a block that he'd have to climb over just because of this little mistake. Which now looking back, that should have been the first thing we did. It was more than just a little phase or something. He First time somebody told me, your kid is really sick, I thought, how dare you telling me, you know, right? sick? What do you mean sick? No, he's really sick. Well, we'll, we'll fix this. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. And it was just all the mental stuff up there that he needed to get out, that yeah. he needed to figure out you know, to be happy. And And it's a process. It's just a journey. It's not easy. It's certainly more challenging for addicted people (laughs) than for non-addicted people because our perspective is a little bit skewed. You know, our our wiring in our brains is done a little different way and it creates some different challenges. Yeah. Yep. You know, and to get to you guys was through uh, just people and places here in Kansas City. The Midwest recovery was through uh, a friend of ours. Right. And then when he didn't succeed there, they gave us your facility. Yeah, I love those guys. Yeah. They were were wonderful. They really were. It's just if you have somebody who doesn't like to be told what to do, which is my son. I can't imagine an addicted person not liking to be told what to do. I know. But you know what? We're so charming in that way. It's that love. I think, you know, you're getting all this love and support and stuff. And I think even even the the people in the facilities, they just want the best for you. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. But I think sometimes if the addict's not ready still, they take it the other way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's my way or the highway. But you can kind of tell, like, one thing I felt with him from the beginning is I definitely felt like he had an intrinsic desire to be a good, solid, sober person. He has a heart of gold, but it also was obvious it wasn't going to be easy. You know, he's fiercely protective of himself and his details and his, uh, as I call it, drama and trauma, right? We've all got our own drama and trauma. But I don't know. I just felt like from early on, I just felt like he really had a desire. He really wants to be good and sober and have a good life. He really does. Oh, yeah. It's just not it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a simple process. Right. So and things have pretty much been easy for him most of his life. Mm-hmm. And I don't say easy. I mean, he, he worked hard to get his grades. He worked hard in football. And everything that he did, he worked very hard for yeah. it. Yeah. But he was also a people pleaser. He had to do everything for the coaches. Or, you know, it, he, he, he just has that in him, which I think at some point all kids do. 
you yeah. know? But there's at some point you have to say, it's about me now. I've got to take care of myself. I mean, we're always there. That's something that we've had to learn, too, as parents is you raise your kids, and you have to remember you have to let them go. You have to. At, at a certain point, you know, you can't always be there for them. And if you are that way, it just hurts them, even if, Very they're, not much a, so. even if they're not addicts. Yeah. You know, they have to have things happen to them in their lives, and they have to figure it out. Yeah. Well, they also – They have to be allowed to do things for themselves, too. And I think for me, on the professional side, this is one of the most frustrating things that I deal with, um, with all of you parents, God bless you, uh, is parents want to do so much for their kids. And for whatever reason, because you love them, I always say, like, there's a very thin line between enabling and parenting. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely thin line. But I'll get these kids, like, in my sober living that will not even have an understanding of how to make a doctor's appointment. Or like I dealt with this just a few weeks ago with somebody had to go mail something at the post office and really didn't know what to do. He's like 24 years old, you know, and I'm just like, holy crap. Like I've moved across the country by the time I was 24 years old. And it's, it does hurt them. It's like they have to do this stuff. Yeah. And then I'll get these calls from parents with failure to launch, right? And I'm like, well, you haven't let him practice. He can't believe in himself or herself, right? I say he because I have men's houses, so that's just yeah. what I deal with more often. But if they don't do things for themselves and believe in themselves they are capable, how are they supposed to go out and live life? It's hard for them to go out and be on their own because they, they've they never had to practice taking care of themselves. Well, they can't Google it. <laughs> they, can't, they can't Google it. And really, you can Google it. That's <laughs> yes, what I can. tell them. 90% of the time, I'm like, Google it. <laughs> I know. It's the basic. That's how I solve all of life's problems. It's I Google the, it. <laughs> it's the basic things in life. Yeah. It's the little things that I, I see it every day in each one of my children. I remember yeah. I remember him saying to me one time, I asked him about something and he goes, Oh, my mom will bring it later when she drops off my groceries. And I just looked at him and I was like, What? And what was it, I wonder? <laughs> I don't remember what it was, but it was the whole thing, like it like the way he said it was like it was room service. You know, yeah. you were dropping off his groceries and I was like, yep. Really, dude? <laughs> and the bad thing is is And I did ask him at one point if you guys wanted to adopt because I know <laughs> I could be your oldest child if you want to adopt. I'm I'm up for that. <laughs> well, and you just do it as a parent. And the funny thing is is my husband and I will say, That's not how we were brought up at all. I mean Right. You know? Right. It's just, it's our generation, and I'm not saying everybody, but I'm just, our generation wanted our kids to have a better chance, I think. For sure. Yeah. At life and more than what we had. And not that we didn't, I mean, we were happy and we had everything. I mean, my childhood was wonderful. Yeah. But when you have children, you just want them to, you know, you want to do everything for them. You want them to have better things. You want them... And really, it doesn't benefit them in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. It, it actually hurts them. My kids always, you know, you, you get good grades and you work hard at your whatever sport you're in and whatever. And, you know, you don't, you're not going to have to get a job. Work on your grades. And, right, right. Well, they should have. You know, it's just little <laughs> things like that that you want to say. Well, I think you want them to have more opportunity. I don't know that, I don't know that anybody, it's like they necessarily, I guess to a certain extent you want to spoil them, but I think really you just want them to have all the opportunities they can possibly have. Right, but is that also just keeping up with the Joneses? You know, I don't know. I hate to say that. I mean, that's that's something that I've learned through all this. You know, you want them to be able to do and and have and and stuff, but really, and you look back now and you think those kids that were were had a job and plus did sports and plus did their grades and everything. They're they're just kind of more well adjusted in some right. aspects, right? Um, but you know, I, I can say this, and I, I can't take any of it back now. It's too late. <laughs> well, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Right. But you know, with all those parents who, uh, that's also the question: Why was that something that we could have done different? Was that something that added to this? But like you said, it's not it's not anything we did at this point. I mean, I I think uh, most kids would they would say that they had a good, you know, childhood and everything, but it's just society now, too. Well, I think it doesn't matter so much 
what your childhood was like. <laughs> you know, right. like, I mean, certainly you have circumstances that are probably going to be a greater indicator that you're going to have problems later on. But not having negative circumstances doesn't mean you're not going to have problems later on. You know, so I just, I don't, I don't think there's so much of a correlation because addiction really kind of takes whoever it wants. And and I think, too, that you, like, I have a lot of addiction in my extended family. You know what I mean? I have a lot of addiction in both sides of my family, for sure. I had those genetics. But, like, my mom is not an addicted person. You know what I mean? Like, not that it necessarily skipped her. Hers just didn't come out with substance. You know what I mean? Like, she has other things that she's pretty compulsive about, but it just wasn't drugs or alcohol. And like I said, when in my teenage life, I, I was a very well-adjusted, confident young person. Right. I really was. It's almost like all of my trauma was put on hold for a little while. You know, <laughs> like I had this chunk of years that my, all my trauma was kind of on hold. And then when I went through, like I said, that heartbreak, my first true love, you know, and had that heartbreak and it just opened the wound, you know, and it was bigger than I could deal with. But I just don't think, I just don't think that all those things match up when it comes to addiction. It's kind of going to take whoever it wants to take. Do you, I've always kind of compared it to like Russian roulette. I mean, you don't know. These yeah. kids will try something, and some kids like it, some kids don't. Right. And you're and so you, right. Also, we're all wired a little bit differently in what is bothersome to us, right? So, like my heartbreak of my first love to another person. They might have been able to deal with that perfectly fine. Not that it wouldn't have been challenging, but they would have been able to sail through that situation without event, right, right. where I couldn't. So, again, I think there there are so many pieces of that puzzle that really have to fall into place. And you just never know who it's going to strike or when it's going to strike. Because that was another thing I said for myself, too, because I really started drinking when I started working in bars. You know, I worked as a bartender for the majority of my adult life. And I always thought, like, if I didn't start working in bars so young, would I have ended up alcoholic? Right. Because, again, I was pretty well adjusted. I was a mellow kid. I had, I was comfortable and confident. So maybe, and now I understand, like, it would have gotten me because it's just who I am. You know, yeah. <laughs> my journey would have just looked a little bit different if I hadn't started working in bars. You know, it would have, maybe it would have taken a little bit longer. I don't know, but I would have ended up the same regardless because it's just who I am there's no way around it <laughs> well and that's what's so confusing because you can get so caught up with all the questions why and what and when you finally get to the point of you you don't have those answers right only you know only God has those answers he knows where you're going and what you're doing right. and, and what's going to happen later on in your life that's when you can kind of put that aside and stop worrying and fill in your head with that 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 fear constantly yeah. as a parent then you can start living life again. You can start realizing just day to day, you don't know what's really going to happen. You know, as a parent, you sit down and you think about all these really philosophical things and you think, you know, I, I could get in a car wreck tomorrow. How's that going to help? I mean, well, how's that going to help my child if if I'm gone? Are right. things just going to get worse? You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow with any of my kids either. I mean, yeah. I could use one, lose one of my other kids. And... It's just out of our hands. Completely. It really is. And it's really hard to get to that point to yeah. really believe that. You know? Because as humans, I don't. it's not in us. Yeah. Because we want to control everything. We want to control for right. sure. And as much as I love each one of my children and my husband, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. And even with my addict, which I've come to terms with, it's not him 24-7 anymore like you know when you when you're first going through all this right everybody else is tuned out you know you don't you know you're not worried about them now I worry about him like I worry about my other kids you know it's it's no different because I know that he he has the tools he's done what he needs to do he's a smart kid I I wish I could be up there in his brain and know everything that's going on <laughs> I don't and hopefully he knows, he knows he has to work on that. Just like I have to work on the things that bother me. Yeah, he's doing great too. He's doing great oh, right now. So proud it's of amazing. him. amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful feeling as a parent to just know that, you know, for the last six months, he's been happy, he's been healthy, 
He's been clean, and it's wonderful. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for coming on and being so open about your story and sharing those details. I know it's not easy. This is such a hard battle to go through. And I just hope that by sharing these stories and and giving all those details that we're helping other people and letting people know that there is support and you're not alone and there is help when you look for it. And what would you say in closing, what would you say has been your greatest lesson over the last five or so years dealing with all of this? Greatest lesson is, one, finding out more about myself and my faith, true faith. I was always, I was brought up Catholic, so I always had it, but it's so different when you really have to search and and reach out to God. And you know what true love is? I loved my kids, but now I really understand true love when you have to go through something like this with your with your child. Yeah. It's a whole different meaning. That's beautiful. What a perfect end note. Oh, thank thank you. you again so much for coming and spending this time with us. I really appreciate your story. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast, candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.